Hello everybody, Pazzi here. Welcome to the Testament of Sherlock Holmes. This is the Saturday morning stream. How are you guys doing? So say hello again to the moderator, Ray. And before we start, I want to say thank you to all my sponsors of the channel, including Moderator Ray, Chris Bowman, Softia42, Michael Vidujak, Lucas Oliveira, Gamer Girl Detective, Danny Safirov, and DS Joyful. So thank you everybody for supporting the channel. And if you want to join this very exclusive club as an elite member or as a fan club member, you may do so by clicking on the join button below all the videos on my page. So doing so will get you access to all the previous broadcasts and live streams with real-time comments. So all those videos will be unedited and unmodified. Now, if you're not into memberships and you still want to support the channel, you can click on the donation button on my main channel page. It's near the top with the capital letter P. It is a one-time PayPal payment. Um, all the funds and all the resources that I mentioned so far will go directly into the streams and into the games that you see on the channel. All these casual adventure games and all these real adventure games like this one that you'll be seeing next, The Testament of Sherlock Holmes. So any amount helps everybody. But again, I want to emphasize one more time, all the things I've said so far, memberships and donations, they are optional. Just you being here watching my videos with no ad removal software. <laughs> that is support enough. Anyway, I think that is enough babbling. <laughs> that is a very long talk that I don't normally give. <laughs> but with that out of the way, it is time to play The Testament of Sherlock Holmes. Here we go. Start a new game. Very excited, guys. Okay, wait up. It's pretty loud in here, guys. Hold on. Let me turn it down a little now. It's a book about pirates with a treasure map. No, I don't think so. I wish that I had seen through all your lies. Oh, start from the beginning, not the middle. 
And so I decided to pick up my pen to relate the most disturbing episode of my life thus far. It all began early one morning in 1898, when Sherlock Holmes invited me to accompany him on a visit to the Marquis of Conningham. Watson, my dear fellow, we can now go and inform the Marquis that we have found the Samoan necklace, and very much faster than Inspector Baines, too, which pleases me. Have you really solved the theft, Holmes? And so quickly? I have indeed, Watson. And believe me, it was completely unnecessary to spread out all over London, as our friend Baines thought was best. He likes to boast that his methods are equal to mine, but once again the outcome has contradicted him. After all these years of accompanying you upon your investigations, I thought that by now I should be reasonably capable of following your train of thought. But in this particular case, I must admit that I don't understand anything at all. Ah, you see, but you do not observe, Watson. There lies the difference. It is a matter of course. A matter of course? In the middle of the night, when everyone is fast asleep, the service bell within that room rings out and alerts the servants. They dress quickly and come running. But the door is locked and there is a strong smell of burning from within. A few seconds later, the master of the house himself, the robbed marchioness's husband, the Marquis of Conningham, arrives and unlocks the door using the sole key. A fire has started inside the room, but they have managed to arrive in time to put it out. It is at that moment that the Marquis realizes that the famous Samoan necklace, which had been safe within its glass cabinet only a few hours earlier, has now disappeared. In order to explain, let us confirm my theory before the arrival of Inspector Baines. Is it too loud, everybody? Is it too loud? I think it's too loud. Testing, testing, testing. How is my voice compared to the characters' voices? Is it too soft? So as you can see, the graphics looks pretty, pretty nice. Yet, <laughs> the developers, they do a much better job in-game graphics than uh, the movie scenes, right? <laughs> the cutscene looks awful. Those children looked awful. <laughs> they look like puppets. But the in-game graphics looks amazing. The volume is fine. Okay, turn it down a little. Oh, I got it, guys. So, to look around, use the mouse. We can rotate the camera like this. And walk in the direction using the keyboard. Click at the broken showcase and click on it. I'm gonna look at the broken showcase. This window was cut with a diamond, a clean, discreet piece of work. This is where the necklace was. See how tiny the hole is, and not one fingerprint upon the window. It's a glass cutter, obviously. Or a diamond ring. I think we all have experience in cutting glasses, right? Using diamond rings. After a clue is examined, the icon will turn green. Please move Sherlock Holmes near the left window. You should see two clue icons simultaneously. To enter examination mode with multi-zone, press the left mouse button. You can switch cursor between items by using the keyboard. Look at both clues. Yes, we can exchange between the two, we can validate our option. A mark undoubtedly made by a diamond. Someone tried to cut the glass, but he was interrupted. A diamond. Therefore, the thief tried to escape through the window, but he was interrupted. Escape through the window, the tiny, tiny window pane. 
That means he have to uh, break those windows apart too. The beams. Okay. Uh, this is our menu icons at the bottom. Journal entries. So this is a log of all the conversations in the game. And our inventory bag. Matches. Pocket knife. Clue board. Alright, badges. <laughs> Alright, we got one more thing to look at. Okay, how do we look at it? Oh, left mouse button, right. All the windows are locked. They've not been forced. Go to the chimney, you will see the hand icon on the magnifying glass. Take it by clicking on it. So this is like a tutorial level, guys. It's teaching us about the mechanics of the game. Now the magnifying glass over here on the fireplace. I kept clicking on the E, guys. <laughs> I'm so used to the Call of Cthulhu controls, you know, E is the action icon, but not in this game. I have to use a mouse. Okay, there we go. So that is in my inventory now. You can open your inventory by clicking the right mouse button. When while playing, you can always activate any of your items from inventory by rolling the central wheel of your mouse. It's a shortcut! You guys see that item on the top right hand corner? So I am rotating the mouse wheel now. Oh, this is very, very convenient, guys. This is awesome. So this opens up the inventory bag manually. The right mouse button. Perfect. And near the piano, some music scores are on the floor. You can activate an item by selecting it in your inventory or directly in the game by scrolling the central view of the mouse. So let's take a closer look at those music sheets. Let us examine the crumpled scores that have fallen off the piano. Ooh, dirt marks, ink marks, very, very tiny handprints. That is a very small handprint, guys. It's even smaller than a baby. If you compare it to the size of the music score, that is a very tiny print. These sooty prints were left by a tiny hand. Very tiny. I don't understand why these music scores are covered with soot. Yeah, I wonder why. Soot? From the fireplace? There's a fireplace in the room. Press R or middle mouse button to switch to first person mode. Oh, I don't know there's a first person mode here. The lady of the house. So, WSAD, the action icons, press L shift, left shift, to make my character run. Oh, yes, I'm running to Dr. Watson! <laughs> you look very good today. So, Press R to switch to point and click mode. Point and click mode. There are three different modes that we can choose from, guys. Oh, this one is not bad, actually. Oh, set camera angles. Okay, this is not too bad. Definitely better than the first person mode. Okay, so... Now, F shift, yeah, we know all this. Running, by pressing spacebar, you activate Sherlock Holmes' sixth sense. It will show you a hint not discovered yet. Ah, all these icons here, guys. You can now search for the other clues in the room. When the servants arrived at the door, having been alerted by the bell, they saw evidence of the theft and the fire, but they didn't see the thief. 
This door is very hard to force. The Marquis is the only person to have the key. The thief could not get out through here until eventually when the door was opened by the servants. Hmm, interesting. So the fireplace. Lots and lots of dirty footprints right in front of the fireplace. It's a mess. Over here, guys. Heading towards his chosen escape route, probably the window, the thief knocked over the stool, which then caught fire. But why didn't he try to put the fire out at once? The fire started here, just beneath the bell pull. Whoever pulled the cord would have had his feet in the fire, unless it was pulled before the fire started. Aha, a bell pull. <laughs> I kept clicking ye. I didn't stop clicking ye. Strange. There are some objects here that have been knocked over. The candle say. And that, uh, the, is it a horse? A horse statue. It's been knocked over. Footprints. You are not going to get on your knees to examine them. There is no need. It is soot. The servants must have trodden in it while they were putting out the fire. So they were messing with the evidence, huh? <laughs> Snell's been contaminated. So lots and lots of shoe prints. The chest wasn't opened. The necklace wasn't in it. A candle. It must have fallen from the chandelier. Ooh. Isn't that odd? Fallen from the chandelier? That's not easy to do. Not very well kept, this aquarium. I can see a dead fish floating on the surface. A dead fish? <laughs> what have been the servants doing? <laughs> can we take a closer look at the fish? So All these the windows window, are locked. They've not been forced. It's still intact. No cracks. No cuts. Now let's talk to uh, Watson here. Is, is that doable, guys? I don't see an icon here, though. Oh, there is an icon. Hold on. Right here. What do you think, Holmes? Let us search the room before the police get here. We might throw some light onto all this. The documents on the tiny table. These documents are not very interesting, even though they're addressed to the Minister of Maritime Affairs. The Marquis himself. Do they not hold a clue? This draft screen makes an ideal hiding place. As the theft was committed at night, I conclude that the thief hid himself behind the draft screen and waited until he was alone in the room. That's very bold of him, guys, hiding here. While there are other people inside the room. That's very bold. Strange. There aren't any prints. Yet I'm sure that the thief hid here. Ah, Mr. Holmes, you're already here. Good morning, Inspector. You've arrived just in time. <laughs> Scotland Yard arrives like the cavalry, always in the nick of time. Ah, but I know that satisfied expression, Mr. Holmes. Have you already solved the case? 
It's possible. We have retraced the thief's rather unusual footsteps. He is a true acrobat. But what I cannot understand is that when the servants entered the room, there was no one to be seen. An acrobat, perhaps, but an invisible one? <laughs> I do not think so. The only explanation is that the thief escaped before the servants arrived. I don't know how, but there is no other way. Half a point for the doctor, nil for the inspector. I am pleased to see that you find the situation amusing, Mr. Holmes. Very well, then. Explain. Dr. Watson was correct when he mentioned acrobatics, but he is mistaken about the nature of the acrobat. As for you, Baines, you're quite incorrect, as the thief was in the room when the servants entered. Explain, for heaven's sake, Mr. Holmes. Watson, how could a thief be missed in the middle of eight men? I don't know. Because he is very small? Stop teasing us, Holmes. Exactly. Because he is small. Small and remarkably agile. You're thinking of a monkey? And a trained monkey at that. Without a doubt, a Leontopicathus rosalia from Central America. Gee, Holmes. The animal had been hidden inside the room for several hours, calmly awaiting the signal from his master. Once night had fallen and the room was empty, a high-frequency whistle alerted the monkey that it was time to begin the procedure for which he had been trained. The monkey emerged from his hiding place and used the point of a diamond to open the glass cabinet and steal the necklace. He headed across to the window by the chimney, but knocked over the stool, which in turn knocked aside the fire guard and started the fire. The frightened monkey jumped from the chimney by swinging from the bell pool, thus alerting the house servants. He then went to the window and began to use his diamond to cut a hole, but was interrupted by the staff trying to gain entry via the door, and he panicked again. He ran across the piano, scattering the music scores onto the floor, before hiding inside the chandelier, knocking over a candle. Finally, the servants and the Marquis entered the room, leaving the door open while they put out the fire. It was during the confusion that our agile little thief made his escape through the doorway. As simple as that. A brilliant explanation. Bravo, Holmes. And the necklace? I can see it from here, my friends. It's right in front of us. We Where? have searched the room from top to bottom, Holmes. How were we unable to find it? because we paid insufficient attention to the only victim of this affair. What victim? No one is dead? The fish? Yes, Watson. <laughs> a poor goldfish, whose destiny was to die, crushed by one of the most precious necklaces Aww, in England. That's awful, guys. He got the crushed. The aquarium is just beneath the chandelier. I understand. The little monkey had likely hung the necklace around its neck and lost it when he leapt from the chandelier. The jewels fell into the aquarium where they remain now. An unfortunate murder victim, the goldfish. Marquis, here is your necklace, intact, just a little wet. Mr. Holmes. This brilliant demonstration does credit to your reputation. Thank you so much, Marquis. Do you wish to verify the authenticity of your jewel? No, I recognize it. I have spent many hours admiring it, you know. Good. I will return it to its box and... Inspector! A bank has just been held up. You must follow me at once. Orders of Scotland Yard. What times? Sirs, duty calls. My regards, Marquis. And well done again, Mr. Holmes. There, the necklace is in its box. We've lost enough time here. Let's go home, Watson. Ah, very well, as you wish. A good day to you, Marquis. With pleasure, gentlemen. And once again, thank you. Well, well, well. Holmes solved his first case in the game. <laughs> we didn't really do anything there, guys. There was only a tutorial, mind you. <laughs> this morning's newspaper. Holmes, have you read this article about you? 
No, Watson, not yet. And I won't have time to. Read it before you leave. It's outrageous. If you insist. It's outrageous. How outrageous? My dear Watson, what is this about? Globe Explorer Sherlock Holmes at the home of the Marquess of Cognicham. The investigation is a fiasco. Yesterday, the celebrated detective Sherlock Holmes was invited to the manor of the Marquess of Cornicham to supply his conclusions following his investigation into the disappearance of the prize's Samoan necklace. It should be recalled that the lady called in the detective after the police appear flummoxed in the face of the astonishing circumstances surrounding the theft. Indeed, the valuable piece of jewelry disappeared while the door to the room in which it was displayed was locked. The alarm was raised by the servants, alerted by the room service bell ringing out during the night. When the Marquis, the only person in possession of the key, opened the door, everyone rushed in and to extinguish a fire that had started before it was noticed that the necklace had mysteriously vanished. Vanished. The most astonishing factor is that no theft or no thief was found within the room, and all the exits were closed. As usual, Mr. Holmes resolved the case in the twinkling of an eye, and a jewel was recovered. I will not waste my time on the various explanations as to, as to the disappearance of because I would prefer to draw your attention, dear readers, to the last surprising developments of the case. Following the departure of Sherlock Holmes, who placed the necklace in the safe himself, the Marquis noticed that the jewel was nothing but a poor copy of the original. <laughs> Let it not be forgotten that the Samoan necklace, although plain and without ornament, is unique because of the rarity of these pearls, pearls which are found only in a small part of the lagoon of the archipelago of the same name, and to which scientists attribute their exceptional quality to the strong density of the crystal of aragonite that they are made of, the priceless necklace brought here at the beginning of the century by Lord Fantor Nodwick, the Marquis' grandfather and an imminent or eminent explorer, should have been part of her daughter's dowry for a marriage to the Duke of Newcastle. So, I'm going to place a simple question. Should we not, in all open-mindedness, ask ourselves if the necklace was not simply a deliberately exchanged for a fake by Mr. Holmes himself? What? <laughs> I am aware, dear readers, that the brutality of this question, without any preconceptions, may certainly shock some of you. But the facts are there, and our thoughts and judgment should not be confused with the regard which we all share for the famous detective. It is not the first time that the Globe Explorer has expressed his reservations as to Sherlock Holmes' methods. Do not forget our counter-investigation into the escape of Arsène Lupin, the Frenchman who took Malin, Malin pleasure in tarnishing the image of our royal family, and who by lucky chance managed to elude capture by Mr. Holmes. At the time, we did not hesitate to consider the toxic complicity on the part of the latter. Of the latter, of those who are familiar with Mr. Holmes, it is quite apparent that his character traits show more of the opportunist and brilliant observer than that of an altruistic defender of the law. I would draw the attention of our readers to the suggestion that the description of this gentleman provided by his friend Dr. John Watson through his stories is a long way from the truth. Indeed, his behavior is derisive, contemptuous, haughty, and offensive towards the police, and in particular towards Inspector Barnes, replacing Inspector Lestrade, who is currently convalescent, and an habitual abuser of narcotics, such as heroin and cocaine. Wow. <laughs> this is why, dear readers, it is important to disregard Sherlock Holmes' good reputation in order to form an objective opinion and to ask the pertinent questions. Was the necklace that Holmes found already a fake? And if that was the case, why did he not mention it? And why should he insist on placing it back within the safe himself? Has the detective some unsavory interest in this affair? 
Or is it a simple case of deceit in order to steal the extraordinary Samoan necklace? It is up to you, dear readers, to form your own opinions, but you can count upon your humble servant to continue revealing to the public the doubtful methods and motivations of one of whom, in the future, I shall not hesitate to call Sherlock Holmes the observer. To be continued, oh, Farley. The ancestry of Prince Woodville recognized the Lord's Committee set up in order to verify Prince Woodville's legitimacy made its conclusions public last night. Without surprise, the Prince's title was confirmed, as rumors suggested in return of an unfavorable opinion by the Committee, the Prince would have abandoned any claim to the inheritance of the present royal family as well as any political activity. The young man, now aged 28, read history and law at Oxford with a diploma in philosophy. He spent most of his childhood in France, when he acquired a considerable knowledge of the culinary arts. For those who might think this a handicap with in when integrating, when integrating into British high society, let me remind you that he is also outstanding on the polo field and plays the bagpipes quite beautifully. Finally, we should add that lately he has become actively involved in charity work and aiding the poor. J.B. Good. Oh, I read the whole thing. Guys. Prince Woodville, <laughs> French culinary expert and bagpipe player, might be our next king. That's not so shocking, my dear fellow. You know exactly to which article I'm referring, Holmes. How can Farley dare to tarnish your reputation like that? Yeah. You know, Watson, that wherever glory walks, jealousy is bound to follow. As for the forgery of the necklace, I suspect that we shall soon be enlightened in this regard. Come in, Inspector Baines. The door's open. 